After the modded madness that was the heavy challenge run, I want to bring things back to basics with my absolute favourite TF2 merc, the one and only Aussie Bush Bandit, the Sniper, who in the process of creating this video I learned is actually a New Zealander by birth. That puts my conscience at ease as I'm not exactly in the best of mood with my Australian brethren after this year's ashes. That one's for the 1% of you watching who know what the hell cricket is. In any case, I spent years of my youth one-tricking this guy on 2-4, shooting the gibbous off everyone I met, training for this exact moment. So undoubtedly, this is the challenge I've been most looking forward to. However, as confident as I am with my headshotting prowess, I anticipate even with a plan to kill everyone I meet, the innate fragility of the sniper is going to come back to haunt me on those later death wish runs. That said, let's get into the usual rule set. I'm attempting to run through the rules faster every single challenge, so let's see how well I can get this one out. Success in this run will be defined by completing Payday 2's career mode with a distinct set of limitations. TF2 Sniper is fairly clear cut when it comes to this, meaning any sniper rifle is fair game to use. Of course, he also has access to an SMG secondary, but given there are dozens of SMGs in Payday 2, I've decided to limit access to only the Compact 5. I will be allowing myself access to Concussion Grenades, which will act as a proxy for my suspicious yellow Jurati, thanks to a mod I've installed, and in the melee slot, all machete type weapons will be fair game. And whilst I'm more than aware of his bow and arrow huntsman playstyle, we already have a full Robin Hood challenge run dedicated to that, so I won't be dipping into the medieval arsenal unless absolutely necessary. As an additional ruling, to spice things up and force me into using most of the game's sniper rifles, I will also be attempting to acquire every single sniper related achievement over the course of this run. In total, there are 21 of these for us to pick up that don't require me to break the rules to obtain, meaning lots of side quests on this one. As ever, we'll be starting out at level 0 with no grinding for XP or money allowed outside of the regular flow of career mode. Everything will be played offline and solo, crew AI is only allowed for crew bonuses and stealth, and we'll be keeping mods to a minimum outside of the usual vanilla HUD+. All challenge runs demand mayhem difficulty from level 0 to 79 before amping up to Death Wish from 80 onwards. Lifelines remain a valuable option if a heist pushes me to the brink, so once again, drop difficulty is back, allowing us to drop a heist difficulty level by 1, crew support will allow us to bring the crew AI along for a loud assist at some point, and rule breaker allows for a single and slight bending of the rules if the time comes that I need it to progress. That all out the way, it's deja vu time for Yelwonk as we reset to step into the shoes of Mr. Mundy, the most professional heister the Payday gang has ever seen. The proxy heister for today's run is going to be Bodhi, not only because I think I have a combined total of like 3 hours on the guy and don't think he'll be returning in Payday 3, but also because he has a unique headshot animation on tasers which fits too well into the head shooting theme. I went and bought the southbound tailor pack for some sniper like apparel, but ended up going for the urban professional fit anyway, so that's a couple of quid down the drain. As ever, getting off the mark on these challenges isn't the easiest. At level 0 I have no challenge legal weapons at my disposal, meaning pacifist stealth is a necessity. Pivoting from the usual car shop, I tried my hand at Murky Station, a heist I've practiced plenty whilst grinding infamies. It seems that practice really has paid off as even without any skills, perks or ways to subdue a guard, I was able to breeze my way through this one, securing both EMP parts in the van. If that wasn't polite and efficient, I don't know what is, leveling all the way to 28 and earning access to this run's first viable weapon, the Rattlesnake. I also had enough cash and experience thanks to this starting route to pick up the Compact 5 for that secondary slot, turning it into a surprisingly believable cleaner's carbine. 28 is also a high enough level to equip my Jurati and the powerful El Verdugo melee weapon, meaning this is by far the strongest I've ever felt out of the gate in a challenge run. Bearing in mind I'm dipping my toes into that Bodhi playstyle, I decided it was about time to showcase some less than stellar ex-president Yelwant gameplay. It's a super viable and fun perk deck that just isn't that well suited for this challenge run format, so I'm going to have to work extra hard for this one. As far as my skills are concerned, I still have to go after the usual challenge run staples, although I have found myself leaning on FAKs less and less, which is extra possible thanks to X Prez's fairly significant healing potential. That said, you can tell I'm not all that confident going into this one, as instead of going for an honourable loud jewellery store, I went for more of that crazy gunman style, the exact stigma sniper is trying to avoid. Having to chop down a few sieves to maintain stealth here does hurt as this is a very money intensive challenge, bearing in mind how many weapons I'm going to need to purchase, but it's probably worth it to keep the heat off me until I get a few more skill points into the build. I attempted something similar with the classic bank heist, but unfortunately threw the drill bag into a wall and was left with a difficult to explain situation to the many sieves watching. 
Not to worry though, I was already in a decent position to fight back against the police response. The Rattlesnake can already one-shot shields and cloakers, whilst dozers can be dealt with from behind cover, meaning many of the usual problem enemies early on are not a big deal for this run. After six and a half minutes, I'd already taken out a school dozer, which usually doesn't happen until the late game section of a run, although that bullet penetration making this possible can be a double-edged sword, case in point, where I managed to land an absolutely filthy no-scope triple collateral, except two of the fallen were her bank tellers, costing me a whopping 48,000 in cleaner costs. I was taking that plan to kill everyone I met just a little too literally, but at least it was standing me in good stead for another first time completion and the real early game wobbles out of the way already, or so I thought. Escapes can always throw a spanner in the works, with this almighty deluge of beat cops landing the first down of the run. Not to worry though, I managed to keep them at bay on attempt 2, essentially circling the park for 5 minutes, waiting out the escape van. Even after the cleaner costs, I had enough cash to afford a shiny new R700 sniper, which I plan to deck out specifically for crits, taking off the scope and turning it into this monstrosity for the diamond store. With 19 detection risk, the idea was that I could stealth this heist, but would still have a viable backup build with crits to boot if things went pear-shaped. This is called preparing to fail, and is often a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, as I royally cocked up this first stealth attempt and was thrown into a loud heist that might have been just a little above my pay grade. After being cursed with the worst escape zone on the map, I attempted to make use of the least known bag shortcut in the game, but the waves of cops were moving against me, carrying the loot off to the middle of nowhere and forcing me out into the open, where I suddenly stopped being able to land a shot, going down as a result. Just like Suit Anarchist, Ex-President really lives and dies by your accuracy as a player, which wasn't ideal in that situation. I'd learned my lesson after cocking up stealth in run 2, resetting the heist instead of toiling for 13 minutes only to be disappointed, which was cowardice well rewarded as third time was a charm, managing to control the entire store after taking out all the guards on the map. And when I say control, I mean execute. Is that better or worse than those blokes that bludgeon their wife to death with a golf trophy? Because I sure as hell have a few feelings on this one. Ah yeah, well, in a results driven business, getting the job done is what matters, bringing us onto Go Bank. This is notoriously a heist I have problems with, and with my Rattlesnake's abhorrent accuracy, it wasn't long before I was getting absolutely overwhelmed by Payday 2's brutal cop melee damage. Attempt 2 got off to a much better start, although with me still lacking greys, it was difficult to deal with groups of enemies, requiring a little jar karate for some much needed crowd control, leaving everyone sopping wet. Taking two shots to deal with 1800 health enemies like tasers and medics was annoying and will be my first build priority to fix, but at the very least, I had a decent counter matchup versus the rooftop snipers. On Mayhem, those guys are the real damage dealers, I mean as long as I can keep on top of the fellow sniper population, I can move around outside and complete the normally challenging cage building objective. I did bring a saw along to deal with the loot boxes, allowing me to set off the balloon and then simply wait for the pilot to snag it, hiding inside the bank vault until the escape popped up, fleeing Go Bank without too many close calls. More money meant a new toy to play around with, and this time I wanted the new Amarok 900 due to its unique damage category being ideal at the moment. Whilst not the apex of the meta, this gun is incredibly fun to use, bringing it to the Parkside Armored Transport heist. Sadly, the brutal reality for this build at the moment is that any unit I can kill can just as easily return the favour as I'm a complete glass cannon. Controlling the pace of the heist well until I got a little too close to yet another gun butt to the face, taking me down unexpectedly early in the heist. Six minutes into the next attempt on what I would normally consider the easiest armoured transport mission, I again found myself going from full health to zero in the blink of an eye. I can see why the sniper likes to camp at this point as going anywhere near the melee range of a cop feels like an instant, unreactable death sentence. Not to worry though, the game eventually took pity on me, granting the perfect RNG for a nice easy sub six minute clear on the third roll of the dice. Transport Crossroads was handed to me next and once again I found myself caught between a rock and a hard place and taken down unceremoniously early on. Clearly holding jokers was essential to place some distance between me and the swads, giving me the space to bring the heat down from afar as I did on attempt 2, just about holding down the dangerous crossroads and making it out after a hard fought escape. The train heist is the final early game challenge we need to surmount before we can earn ourselves a little upper hand and get a full build with greys together. I decided to go with the platypus for this one purely to blow the inside of a few tasers heads all over four counties. Oh yeah, that's the one. The counter sniping on this heist is absolutely egregious though, I swear this cop team composition is so imbalanced, but it causes me one hell of a headache. In the end, after 20 minutes of hard graft and a quarter of the ammo bags already secured, the cops for once started to pay attention and move them away, causing me to panic, drop myself right out in the open and eventually get cut down with the help of my opposite number on team SWAT. The train heist is always a slog, however I was actually enjoying using the platypus, a sniper I seldom use out of choice on my main account, managing to hit a true triple collateral for the achievement 10 minutes in. 
Ammo wise though, we did have an issue, as without Graze unlocked, I was slowly going negative in the count, meaning I needed to land as many headshots and collaterals like that one as possible to stay afloat. Eventually, I had just enough gas in the tank to push over the line, securing all 20 bags of ammo in decent time for once, earning me the largest payday of the run so far, enough to purchase the Desert Fox for a future crit orientated build when I have enough skill points to make it. Vlad likes to give us a bit of a rest at this stage, with four stores offering up an absolutely delicious quad for my montage, and unfortunately this run's first crash. I had no idea what was causing it at this stage, but let's just say Pierce and the diesel engine might not be the best of friends, and leave that one for later. If there was a heist to crash on though, I'd probably pick four stores, so no big deal. I ran this one back unscathed in just a few minutes, grabbing the Seer of Death achievement for 500 sniper headshots already, the final generic achievement I needed to pick up on this run. More Crasher is more of the same, leaning on the SMG to do most of the window killing, whilst my recently buffed AWP with Graze took complete control of the long sightlines, resulting in a very simple clear. Fair to say, the game's been making this so easy I'm actually getting worse, as I went down on White Xmas for possibly the first time ever in this series, fumbling my FAK into a tree trunk and failing to place it down in time. Unsurprisingly, when actually paying attention to the video game, this heist isn't much of a challenge, meaning a clean second time clear. Using my more concealable Desert Fox, I put together a solid stealth build to tackle a Ukrainian job, which turns into a bit of a waiting simulator, so it's right up Sniper's Alley, an easy, if boring, stealth completion. The same cannot be said of Meltdown though, a heist that without fail seems to take a few years off my lifespan every time around. Except, in what begins a pattern of failing heists like White Xmas and succeeding on heists like Meltdown, I found myself blitzing through the first section of the heist, no scope in the world, and using Bloodthirst to give those a little of the old chop chop, making them less of an issue than they had ever been before. For this stage of the run, this might be the strongest I've ever felt, and whilst I remain incredibly fragile, the long range damage I'm packing more than makes up for it on a heist like this one. I also think the adaptation I made after the heavy run of actually using the Longfellow instead of just relying on forklift speedrun strats has really helped when it comes to survivability. This heist wasn't without its sticky moments, getting trapped between a pair of turret vans before successfully brute forcing my way through on the first run, and making a bizarre bargain with this turret to luck the other way on the final escape. So in a wild turn of events, this was a true first time meltdown clear, meaning it's only natural that I'd head into the vastly easier aftershock and get one click deleted by the first rival sniper I saw sensational. Honestly though, maybe I'm underselling Aftershock as after 11 minutes and half my FAKs down, I failed to pay attention to the 7 bloody snipers on my hood, quickly getting 2 tapped and dominated by this guy. I'm so happy sniper fire rate seems to have been tuned down in Payday 3 because that was not particularly fair. With snipers causing me so many problems, I decided to switch over to the long range platypus again, which was the adaptation I needed to push through this heist. For a fellow who drives a camper van most of the time, my truck driving skills really weren't up to par with snipers' abilities, but the cops were more than accommodating in how they just wandered into my grill by choice, meaning I could secure the safes and, despite one seriously close call with Bodhi's nemesis, the taser, could clear the heist this time around. It's now time for the next massive addition to the arsenal, in the machina there it is, the Thanatos 50 Cal, a weapon that might end up being essential to victory later in the run when dozer health pools get up to 24,000. On the opposite side of the discretion scale, I also purchased the highly concealable Grom, meaning I have the foundation of a proper stealth build when called into action. For now though, these might be overkill for little old nightclub. This heist is, as you know, a bit of a Sydney sleeper, offering very little other than the sound of spinning drills for 8 minutes, if you're lucky. I got out in about 11, which is good going for a snooze fest like this one. After that, I added the R93 to my weapon pool, equipped with an ACOG as more of a medium damage close quarters option. This was perfectly suited to the scope of Stealing Xmas, a heist where I was able to go to town, two-shotting dozers, and covering everyone else in Jurati for an easy first time clear. Hector's trio of jobs start now with Watchdogs, which never pushes me too hard, so acts as the perfect hunting ground for achievements, and to mess around with the underused sniper rifles. As such, I equipped the Nagant and went to town, turning everything above the SWAT's necks into a fine red mist. I mean, look at this guy, his head really is MIA. That gritty Payday 3 violence is already here. My confidence was also sky high at this stage, landing sweet jump shots as I attempted to rekindle my Call of Duty MLG days. Day 1 was easy, and day 2 no harder, as I tore my way through another quick and painless completion. Which brings us on to Firestarter, where once again, my hubris got the better of me, and that refusal to pack shotproof when I can just shoot the taser anyway, caught me out. Taser the floor on attempt 1. But for those of you worried about the lack of failure on this challenge so far, don't worry, it gets worse, when the bloody Mendoza saw to me on attempt 2. The next try was bittersweet, as I clinched the maximum penetration achievement with an R93 shield kill, but then fell for a sneak attack a couple of seconds later, still losing health incredibly quickly at this stage. 
As much as I'm doing my best to make this look hard, it really isn't. So by attempt 4, I was able to secure the warehouses, land an orgasmic graze shot, and start securing the bulk of the weapons at the van. It's graze moments like this which remind me why I play with a custom HUD. Day 2 was another easy opportunity to record some hot graze plays, picking up a fair few multi kills on my way out with the servers. Day 3 is just the bank heist again, except this time I had an R93, meaning I remembered to purchase the often forgotten vantage point on this heist, granting me a zipline from which I could farm up some sniper kills, picking up the last action villain achievement with a six shot in the process. Again, nothing else to write home about as far as difficulty is concerned. Finishing Hector's jobs off with rats, the achievements just keep coming as I racked up my 250th rattlesnake kill for public enemy number 1. Things did get a little heated right at the end of the meth cooking process, but my Joker bravely stepped in for me to save the day and secure the completion. After an incredibly uneventful escape, we moved on to the usually uneventful day 2, except this time I rolled the cop raid RNG. Things were going fine, until once again a taser got his claws into me right in front of the only sniper on the map. I was pretty happy to see no adverse RNG on attempt 2, but still couldn't resist the opportunity to pick up a free rattlesnake collateral for the double kill achievement, which did result in me coming very close to botching this one as those gangsters hit damn hard. FAKs carried me over the line, at which point we get to see the beauty of sniping on the bus stop mission. Yep, that is a nice 10 second clear, rare that I'm able to show you the complete footage of a heist. The elephant comes steaming in next with Big Oil, a heist I've grown to really love recently, finally getting a chance to use my hybrid stealth Grom build. With ECMs, this trivializes day one thanks to the usual rush strategy, and helped me to easily access the override unnoticed on day two. The only problem is, I sometimes go AFK during these long hacking sections, which wasn't the sharpest move seeing as security can stumble across this server room. Bloody hell. No worries though, this security guard is awful and just gave me a chance to shoot him in the back of the head. Alas, I was cursed with a 10% chance for an enemy to fire when shot, and already alerted. True RNG pain. Not to worry though, this is set up intentionally as a hybrid build with full access to most ex-president perks, jokers, and at least passable weaponry. I knew I'd have to go loud at some point on Big Oil regardless. With the hack almost already done, I had every chance of clearing this heist even from here, locating the correct engine almost immediately and calling in Bile for the pickup. With any wide open map like this one, it's possible to really stretch the cops thin and mostly avoid getting cornered, which was exactly the approach I took, allowing my jokers to take on most of the heat whilst I pseudo stealth my way to the plane almost unopposed. I've always said that hybrid stealth and loud builds just kinda suck, but having that versatility on a challenge run like this is so much more valuable than I've ever experienced playing normally. But I'm gonna be praying those stealth skills hold up, heading into Framing Frame, where one of the toughest sniper specific achievements must be cleared. We Do It Live requires the heister to complete framing frame whilst using no skills, wearing suits and pivotally wielding the Platypus 70 and Judge shotgun. I can carry the judge into a heist, I just can't shoot it, meaning that leaves us about as bare bones as we can get with this build, unable to go even below 49 detection risk. Sadly, those limitations being we'll absolutely have to stealth as there's no way I can handle this heist in loud, but even in stealth, we can't shoot as the Platypus cannot be silenced. Yeah, I really didn't think this one through. Oh well, even with high detection risk, day one is very doable, although there was no way I was planning to grab more than the four base paintings required to clear it. I was also forced to perform a little murder, just one painting from victory, getting trapped by the death guard, at which point it was just a mad dash to victory. I made it, but the alarms were sounded. That gave day two a decent chance of going loud with the ambush, but I was lucky enough to avoid it in the end, so that's two thirds of the heist already done. Except it isn't. Let's be honest, Framing Frame is probably the most backloaded heist in terms of challenge, and Day 3 had it all still in store for me. Attempt 1 was ended by a guard on the balcony, able to quickly spot me thanks to my high concealment. On run 2, I realised I was out of body bags at the worst moment, panicking and running upstairs straight into another guard who shot on sight. Run 3 was going great, grabbing devices in record time, but again leaving a body out on the staircase to be found almost immediately. Run 4 was a complete splatter fest, using up all my pages and piling up the bodies on the top floor landing where they were found by the spawning guard. Run 5 was aborted when the vault room was out in the open, basically untenable RNG for a challenge like this one. Run 6 was a classic payday chain reaction, with security seemingly always in the right place at the right time to break stealth. Run 7 was just an outright cock up. I kind of broke on run 8, getting caught at the coke planting section of the heist, which sadly earns you nothing, forcing me straight into a 6.5 minute mandatory hack with no skills, half a weapon and facing down AI that are hell bent on disrupting the power supply. Unsurprisingly, this wasn't very sustainable. I got myself cuffed on run 9, performed a proper shiving live on camera on run 10, and was prevented from intimidating this guard on run 11 by a pesky hard drive interaction getting in the way. 
All six of the guards on the goddamn map decide to converge in a 10 meter radius of each other to soundly ruin run 12, whilst 13 was another classic Payday 2 scenario where trying to quickly run by a guard results in them spotting you and shooting immediately due to breaking line of sight. Finally, on run 14 I lost all object permanence and got spotted by a guard I was fully aware of for no apparent reason. My psyche was admittedly breaking, but I never lost hope, and after a bloody start to the 15th attempt, which was actually ideal as it allowed me to reduce the patrolling population, I was able to secure all 5 devices in under 2 minutes. From there I started moving the bags to the vault one by one, until impatience got the better of me and decided to risk throwing all 6 remaining bags down the vent at once, successfully securing all 8, allowing me to finally clear framing frame after well over an hour, with that nasty achievement in tow. That was a challenge run in and of itself, so I was happy to receive even the tiniest bit of respite over on election day, ECM rushing day 1, but intentionally tagging the wrong truck to access my preferred day 2 to grind up dozens of sniper kills with the rattlesnake. This was a huge success, as these guys seem to spawn about once a minute, and from one sniper to another fellas, give up. You lads do not pose much of a threat on this predominantly indoor heist, meaning I was quickly able to secure the return to sender achievement and escape the heist while still dominating every sniper on the map. It's the Thanatos' time to shine now, putting together a high value target build for maximum dozer destruction. On larger, long sight lined heists such as Big Bank, it was possible for me to get distance on these guys, guaranteeing a two shot kill even with body shots. Admittedly, I was also forced to carry ammo to sustain this playstyle, but my almost fully leveled ex-president perk deck added enough healing for me to survive without the usual FAKs. I'm actually quite proud of myself for moving away from that crutch, at least for the time being. To earn the far, far away achievement, my best bet was taking out snipers on the opposing rooftops, and dozer kills were pretty easy to come by with my current setup. How the hell we earn these achievements without tracking capabilities back in the day, I will never know, but in Modern Payday 2 I'm able to keep tabs on things within my hood. Securing 10 dozer kills first, although I really didn't need to go out of my way for this one as it turns out, and then grabbed the final sniper kill for two thirds of the Thanatos specific set, thinking I'd not have much use for this sniper later into the run, which absolutely turned out to be false. In any case, Big Bank was just sort of happening in the background around this achievement hunt, so after lugging the last couple of money bags to the lift, I escaped with relative ease. Long time viewers will be aware that this is the point at which I can ding level 80 depending on stealth bonuses, which is precisely the case this time around, meaning I'd have to tackle the difficult Hotline Miami on Deathwish, something I'm not sure I've needed to attempt as of yet. For it, I meticulously crafted a sweet Desert Fox crit build, and then ruined it by equipping the saw, demolishing my concealment and making low blow useless. But even without crits, I was surprisingly well equipped to handle all the threats of day one on Hotline. More corridor spawn sniping was just what the doctor ordered, and my counter sniping prowess was unmatched next to the previous Merc runs. With such solid map control, I was easily able to gain access to the basement at the first time of asking, cracking the code and escaping onto day 2, all without really feeling the heat. The claustrophobic day 2 would be a different story though, for my sightline loving build. Graze is still overpowered in the penthouse, but there's not a lot of room to operate in here, and my squishiness really is self evident as a green bulldozer ran over me in just one pump. It gets more embarrassing on run 2, where I managed to sprint directly into a claymore. As promising as run 3 was looking after picking up nothing personal for Desert Fox sniper kills, Deathwish really amps up the challenge of Payday's bulldozer contingent, as Ismodozers take over from their green brethren as some of the most dangerous on the difficulty, ending me 10 minutes in. Then, as the Payday gods sometimes like to do, they gave me no choice but to die by airdropping a minigun dozer right in front of me before I really had the chance to set up. These setbacks were nothing on what came next though, as for every attempt to come, once I opened up the gate to enter the upstairs section of the heist, it would crash. Not the end of the world, there are ways to skip day 1 without earning experience or money to get right back to day 2, but the problem was, I was completely softlocked here. Again and again I triggered the objective, only to be met by Payday 2 closing itself. This was strange, especially bearing in mind I had been able to pass this point just fine during the first few attempts. A classic Payday 2 conundrum that didn't make a whole lot of sense. However, after much testing, one event much earlier in the run unlocked a core memory. Remember the four stores crash? Looking back at the footage, it seemed like it was caused by me ending a heist whilst the cop was suffering from the visual Girati effect added by the mod. So, knowing it could cause crashes, I removed it, and lo and behold, the game just works again. If any of you diesel engine Sherlocks want to get to the bottom of exactly what was happening here, be my guest, but for now, I'm afraid to say that I have to get rid of the piss bombs. I know, I know, an unpopular decision to be sure. But it was the only way I could see to proceed, although even without the game breaking, there were no guarantees I could make it through Deathwish Hotline Miami. The true attempt 5 was cut short by a little self-immolation, you know, the usual, while 6 went the same way as run 1. 
Finally, run 7 was the gold dust I've been looking for, putting together an accomplished heist by predominantly holding down the left side room and grazing everyone who came close to oblivion. The key was to basically cheese everyone by shooting them through walls. Not the most honourable approach, but certainly a sniper-esque tactic. Once the vault was open, I backed away and just sort of allowed a broken shield marshal to take out his anger on the Russian, taking down the commissar without having to break a sweat. And with that, the buggiest, most broken Hotline Miami run was complete. Whatever I faced now would at least be less of a technical challenge. I saw Hoxton break out as an opportunity to pick up some more cloaker kills with the Thanatos, packing ammo and the saw, and basically spawn trapping the SWATs from the get-go. With a pair of jokers at my side, I was able to shoot a little more sparingly and move from cover to cover and objective to objective, escorting the driver all the way to the parking lot. Hostage taker was doing a lot of the heavy lifting as far as my health pool was concerned, after a few close calls, but with a now maxed out ex-president deck, I was also much more survivable than I had been earlier in the run, eventually making this minigun dozer's helmet into a nice bowl for his brains, before fleeing straight into day two. Not for the first time, I wished I was wearing my Razorback for this one, after a gang of cops snuck up on me to follow up on the opportune sniper shot that had already crapped my armour. Not really a death I could have done a whole lot about. In fact, failure number two here was a fairly similar situation. I was unable to react to going from full to zero health in under a second. Now, this didn't make me angry, as I tend to only lose my rag when the fault is clearly my own, but it also wasn't exactly a good omen for the rest of the run if I was repeatedly going down without a fight. This meant I really needed to sort out my positioning, as I have a terrible habit of trying to kill everything before it kills me, instead of prioritising that whole not dying thing first and foremost. This was something I really focused on on attempt 3, channeling my inner cosy camper and just staring at the power box between each outward objective. Letting them come to me avoided another death from being flanked, enabling me to grab the server and make my way to the escape by force. Up until now, I'd purposefully avoided the sub-200 damage category of sniper, not because they're weak in general, honestly, on the contrary, they're probably the strongest snipers in the game in the right build, but with ex-president functioning as a health perk deck, I wasn't confident running Berserker with them, which is essentially a core skill to hit most breakpoints. However, the Lebensorger has a necessary achievement, so it's time to take the plunge on Hoxton Revenge. Here I pulled off one of my favourite moves in stealth, the silent entry tech, where you move into the safe house alongside a guard to dodge the lasers completely. I nailed this, only to completely forget how the heist works and opened a window, setting off the alarm timer which I was just about not able to locate in time to save stealth. Oh well, I'd already found the vault so it was time to get to work regardless. Headshots were even more crucial with the WA-2000, but at least I had the occasional crit on my side to help out against dozers. To be fair, the Lebensorger is so overtuned at this point in terms of ammo capacity you pick up and reload speed that it was still overperforming even in this less than ideal setup. As such, I was able to get the panic room open, engage Hector in a lengthier than usual gunfight, before finding and securing these six bags of evidence required to escape. Side note here, but being able to instantly delete enemy snipers is such a liberating feeling after dozens of challenges that have limited my effective range to about a stone's throw. I spent a lot of time on the Diamond Heist next, rocking the Mosin Nagant and trying to grab kills on repelling enemies, which is just the ball hake you're imagining it is. The regular Bank Heist is probably best for this achievement, but I failed to think ahead, so watch as I struggle to land killing blows in the brief window I have to shoot whilst the cop is still attached to his rope. Pure torture. In the end, I just planned to clear the heist after already grabbing the diamond, but slipped up tremendously on the way to light the flare. No worries, more chances to stare at the sky waiting for cops to repel next to me, or so I hoped. This dozer, control alt deleted me, preventing that plan. To be clear, this is not a difficult heist, so when I went down a third time, I was starting to get a tad embarrassed. My performance on run 4 was so bad I was getting shields thrown at me, such was the disgust of my enemies. Attempt after attempt on a heist that's usually a one and done is a blow to the old ego so much that I even switched over to the stealth build, broke stealth and still got nailed at the end. Eventually, I just decided to change things up completely, giving up on the repelling kills and switched over to the R93 for much more consistent damage. Finally doing enough to clear the heist and move on is what I'd like to tell you, but again, Payday decided to have its way with me and spawn a silent Skulldozer behind me to catch me completely out of cover. Rough. 11 heists later than I'd expect from myself, I finally pulled it together for this one, not messing around going for some arbitrary achievement or trying to land a record number of kills, just ruthlessly tracking the objectives all the way to completion at long last. And as has been the way of things with this challenge run, obviously I then went on to first time clear the Golden Green Casino, an objectively harder heist without even so much as a nasty scare. You know, if this is a sign of things to come, I'll roll with it, just so long as you let me first time clear Biker Heist, please. 
That's a few heists off though, first I had to get past the bomb dockyard, for which I decided to go with the stealth approach for a change of pace. Run 1 was foiled by a civilian and an unseen camera, but Run 2 liked to be going the distance. Usually, once I've found the keycards, this heist is all but done, but this time, I managed to get spotted using the PC in the office, leading to a pager chain reaction I couldn't save. Caught out in a stealth build, this wasn't looking great, but I'd done enough before the alarm went off to start the ship moving process, meaning just maybe I had enough gas in the tank to make it all the way. I clung onto this slim hope that was really just held together by the pair of jokers available to my build, as I located the bomb parts and started moving them towards the helicopter escape, which I had actually planned in pre-planning in case this exact situation played out. This turned out to be an inspired move, as I was sluggishly able to move the individual parts using my ECM jammers to hold the spawning dozers in place for long enough to keep them at bay. The Grom had just enough firepower to deal with regular foot soldiers, meaning as long as the dozers were incapacitated, I actually had a surprise path to victory, which I walked with express relief. Probably the most effective I have ever known the range-limited ECM feedback to be, meaning we can chalk up another surprise W for the hybrid stealth build. Scarface Mansion is up next, a heist I saw as the perfect opportunity to seek out the names of a friend so I don't need one achievement with the Leven Sorga. Back in the day, this was an interesting challenge, requiring 11 kills without reloading with a 10 bullet mag, demanding perfect accuracy and at least one collateral. However, the balance team decided to buff the Leven Sorga's mag size by 5, pretty much devaluing this achievement altogether. On this challenge run though, it still isn't the easiest as I'm difficulty locked, meaning a high population stealth heist like Scarface's is the ideal environment to land nothing but one hit kills, a feat I achieved on my very first attempt, whilst also clearing the outdoor section of this heist with relative ease. Overall, Sniper Stealth actually turned out to be hugely successful, making the exterior section a breeze, allowing me to prove that I did have a job, not mental sickness, and was an assassin after all, taking out Sozer in a single bullet and clearing this heist almost fast enough to earn the speedrun achievement. Speaking of those achievements, I decided that the 20 levels of crime spree needed to proceed at this point would be perfectly suited for a little farming, switching back to the Nagant setup that caused me so many problems on the diamond. I really should have learned my lesson back then though, as this switch proceeded to be deadly after I went into custody on a simple first world bank run. Normally this wouldn't be a big deal as I could just buy back the spree with continental coins, but this time I've been spending them so actively on weapon attachments I actually had none left. This was an annoying setback, forcing me to do more crime spree heights than I'd really like to, but at the very least Brooklyn 1010 gave me another opportunity to rack up repel kills farming on the rooftops for almost half an hour before I finally got the achievement to pop on the escape. And then I got tased on Aftershock, again not having enough continental coins to buy my way back. Oops, not for the first time, the hard things are easy, and the easy things are hard for the sniper. Fortunately, I could end the crime spree, earn back some continental coins, and then have enough to purchase spree level 20 again, allowing me to simply head into the FBI headquarters for a little server recovery. Day 2 of Firestarter is so easy, I was able to make my way through it only hip firing the platypus, picking up 10 headshots in a row for the no scope achievement, before finally clearing the crime spree portion of the run. The trials and tribulations don't end there though, as I was again humbled by a taser on the next required heist, Counterfeit. Shockproof would have saved a whole lot of pain on this one. At the second roll of the dice, I had an incredibly intense holdout at the pump, needing to land basically every shot to stay afloat, which is always more nerve-wracking without FAKs, doing just enough to finish the pressure drilling and escape down in the sewers thanks to high-value target. I suffered another nightmare FWB with the Thanatos build before deciding to pivot on over to stealth for this one, which also caused some problems when apparently my Grom managed to penetrate half the map specifically to break a window and get me detected. Live by the sword, die by the sword when stealth sniping, I suppose. An impatient slip-up on attempt 3 also resulted in a quick reset. Fortunately, I held it together on run 4, keeping my rifle in my pants for the first half of the heist, before blasting all three of the vault guards to avoid any potential drama later on. A quick and easy stealth clear in the end. More stealth next with Murky Station, a heist that I'd already managed to clear with nothing, so I was sure as hell able to zoom through it as a pacifist once again this late into the run. That brings us on to the always challenging Boiling Point, where I was finally able to add the Pronghorn, a secondary sniper to my build, pairing nicely with the ammo guzzling Thatos. Now, I've had issues with this heist before, but I think this might be the squishiest build I've ever entered this Russian Tundra with. With its massively amped up tasers, I could be mince me in seconds, even with Die Hard active, going down almost immediately if I couldn't take them out first. Three taser related incidents later, and things were looking a little bleak. I still hadn't even managed to make it into the compound, never mind the highly dangerous escape, and the failures just kept rolling from there. 
In hindsight, I think I was underutilizing the Thanatos early on, which was something I eventually adapted to, making it inside the laboratory for the first time on run 7. We weren't out the woods yet though, as despite picking up some huge bulldozer kills, as well as the final Thanatos achievement dodge this, it still wasn't enough to stay alive up against the insane spike damage of the tasers. Not for the first time in a challenge run, it's time to swallow my pride and pivot back to the FAK spam and the dreaded clutch of Fain Death. Heading back in, it looked like this build change had made no difference at all, despite switching back to the trusty R93. A second chance was very much appreciated when death came so quickly, and my damage was still fairly admirable, but tasers always seemed to find a way to ruin everything. Until finally on run 10 I held it all together, switching back to the Thanatos just in time to deal with the turret RNG, and push into the escape with confidence, with the counter snipers heads looking 12 feet tall for once thanks to my long range scope, forcing through that eventual completion. It was at this point I realised the terrible mistake I'd already made though. I was getting into the tail end of this challenge run whilst forgetting that Payday 2 completely pivoted away from rideable zip lines about 7 years ago, so every remaining high slacked one, except for the dreaded goat sim. That's right, to earn the didn't see that coming did you achievement, I needed to rely on this zip line. Now, going into this, I only needed 3 more kills, but after picking up the first with this mean no scope 5 minutes in, it would be another 10 minutes of fame death refusing to let me die before I finally landed shot number 3, earning the achievement, before finally getting kicked into custody by none other than a goat. Fitting, really. As I quickly quit the heist, I pondered, whilst choosing Santa's workshop instead, if I'd have ever completed the challenge run if this wasn't an optional choice. Probably not based on how it went in the demo run. Either way, Santa's Workshop isn't necessarily a walk in the park when you've got regular beat cops seemingly two-shotting you. Someone from the DSOD community really needs to come and save my build apparently. At least it was good enough to get me through this one at the second time of asking, clearing another small hurdle in the run. Car shop is car shop. I reckon I'd have a decent chance of smashing my way through it with my eyes closed at this point, which brings us onto the dreaded biker heist day one, voted as worst heist in Payday 2 by the great council of me. I think I exclusively despise this one. Run 1 was massively assisted by finding the engine part immediately and having the seat objective early on, as this one is much easier before the snipers start to spawn. Objective 3 was of course the dreaded garage, which has ended more challenge run attempts than I care to remember. However, for once I have an offensive tool for just about everything the game can throw at me, so as much as I can be a sitting duck, I am a bloody powerful one. A taser very nearly broke my heart 10 minutes in, getting incredibly lucky with this flinch to save the run, but from there I actually had enough damage and crowd control to hold out for objective completion before eating more sniper shots than I bargained for on the run back. This required that sweet, sweet RNG we know and love to keep the run alive with the aid of feigned death, an opportunity I wasn't going to miss out on, ensuring there were no overwatching snipers before rushing for the bike and pushing toward the escape. In a moment of pure nervous madness, I managed to spin out here, resulting in this mad FAK spamming moment where you can see I must have been shaking based on my aim. Had a bunch of blue swats ended this run so deep, that might have just ended the entire run as my spirit would have been absolutely crushed. So rejoice as I was able to slip away for the first ever first time clear of Biker Heist Day 1 this series has ever seen. Let's hope that's setting a new precedent. After that, day 2 felt like a quiet evening stroll, although I did find myself running out of places to put holes in the biker boss after firing almost all of my 50 caliber ammo into her for mediocre results. Eventually I wore her down though and escaped to put the biker heist behind me in record time. A huge relief. That moves us on to Panic Room, where as has been the theme for this run, I managed to die to a single basic gangster. Run 2 was a lot more successful though, as I was better prepared for the sniper objective than I ever have been before, with Grays enabling me to take control of the rooftop so long as I kept landing my shots. The concussion grenades are huge when it comes to making space to plant the C4, meaning I just need to hold out through two more assault waves to escort Bile away with the panic room in tow, turning the upper floors into a scene straight out of Diablo 4 before running back down to the sewers to complete another tricky heist with comparative ease. Brooklyn 1010 is another heist that requires me to run a less standard build in order to pick up the Apartment Sniper achievement, going with the R93 with the Source Secondary to make sure I was picking up all my kills over distance. There's some serious wallbang potential in this heist, meaning I finally picked up the You Can't Hide achievement on an unsuspecting shield. The second apartment is where this heist really heats up though, and a tag teaming pair of dozers put a swift end to attempt number one. Fortunately, unlike the biker heist, I actually enjoy this one, so running it back wasn't the end of the world. Again, I had a huge close call pinned down next to the cage here, but with the power of some massive grey shots and these dozers apparently short attention span, I was able to hang on through it all and make it down to the escape. 
Here, not for the first time in the challenge run, Twitch chose to just ram straight through the police blockade, opening the path to another successful heist. With the stealth-only yacht heist up next, I decided to use a few spare perk points in Hacker to actually give me a stealth perk. Even if it doesn't particularly fit the sniper playstyle, almost anything goes when it comes to perk decks in the Merc rule sets. I didn't end up needing the pocket ECMs, but the insurance is always nice to have, as after filling up the guest room toilet with body bags, I was able to head down to the control room and steal the hard drive for a successful first time clear. Undercover is always a difficult heist to really rank, as it's very dependent on the RNG you run into. Here on run 1, I got the car right where I wanted it, but failed to account for the two Rheinfeld bulldozers romping their way downstairs. Attempt 2 chose to drop the car down the side of the building, which also offers more cover than the apparently planned rooftop drop, giving me room to deal with most of the snipers before they could deal with me. Once I have the Tatsman in position though, Undercover quickly becomes a corridor shooter of dreams for any Grey's setup, allowing me to hit multiple massive multi-kills. The crit dynamic of this Desert Fox build was also doing me proud, as I turned and one-shot this dangerous Skulldozer right as the hack finished. From there, I was easily able to head up to the rooftop and make it to the escape virtually unscathed. Slaughterhouse is another tough heist from the classics that tends to take a few scalps and even threatens my lifelines. However, I'm starting to feel like the Thanatos and Pronghorn build is fairly undefeated, with Pronghorn headshots dispatching most units rapidly and the Thanatos making mincemeat out of dozers, especially along those long corridors where we can even make use of them as massive graze proxies. The usual problem is of course carrying the loot in the first place, but I seem to have learned how to maximise the bad conga line these days, needing to only take two trips now through the dangerous open field. The first was unopposed by snipers, but the second required a little counter-sniping before the coast was clear. Honestly, I'm having a lot of fun with this run, as I always feel powerful, but never safe, which is exactly how a good challenge run should play out. I love this job, sunshine's free, bullets are cheap, and everybody's got a helmet to send flying. It really is the secret to Payday 2's satisfying gunplay. After one more round of sniper killing, the goal was in place, and all that remained was a surprisingly simple escape for yet another first time clear. And with the run at full steam ahead, of course the natural thing for me to do was step away from it and not touch Yelwonk for over a month. You see, this was all recorded just before my initial trip to Sweden, and in the following weeks I was just too busy to return, until late July where I picked back up with the sniper and had absolutely no recollection of the 30 hours of gameplay I'd already recorded. Classic. Even so, this is the home stretch now as we head off for Beneath the Mountain. A sniper build is really well suited for this one, with long corridors to shoot down in the compound and many long range units spawning at the escape. Even so, it was all too much on run 1 when I was completely deleted by what I think was a shield on the way to the escape. Run 2 pitted me against 4 dozers at once, but the core strength of packing the Thanatos in this build is that even that sort of terrible spawn luck shouldn't derail an attempt, especially when Fain Death lends a helping hand, eventually forcing my way through and up to the escape. Once I'd avoided the danger of being jokerless at this stage, it was just a simple case of refueling from the helipad and taking off into the sunset. Its big brother, Birth of Sky, is a much more difficult heist though, but at least the opening gauntlet offers only the juiciest of collaterals to get that morale up before jumping down into the dust bowl consisting of overpowered beat cops. Whilst I survived this initial landing, I wouldn't be on my feet for long, going down for good just under the sheer pressure of those early spawning units. Attempt 2 consisted of a much smoother landing, and with the broken pallet being in cover this time, it was much easier to rebuild without taking fire from all directions. That's the first hurdle of this heist, the second being the snipers, who spawn after about 8 minutes, but they fall easily to my pronghorn. The final and greatest hurdle is of course the sewer escape, which lived up to its messy reputation here. Despite being first meleeed into oblivion, I was through the primary gate quickly thanks to the concussion grenades and faint death. But instead of running into the anticipated triple Skulldozer threat next, which I was actually ready for for once, I instead charged headlong into an absolute swarm of regular cops, who tore through my flimsy build, requiring a second lucky FD proc and my concussion grenades to stun this taser, saving the day with another couple of massive Thato snipes. By no means was this a simple completion, but I'll take a two try birth of sky any day of the week. And with the long range heat street up next, I felt set. But things are never as you anticipate in these challenges, as I went on to fail in the first couple of minutes of the heist four times consecutively. The initial swarm of beat cops was simply proving too much for ex president to handle, which really requires some build up kills to grant any protection. There were some strange and topical happenings taking place on this one too, with cops frequently being beamed down from the heavens on top of me, and also seemingly returning to the mothership uninvited. I got a bit further on this run, but was eventually held at the side street choke point and rushed down by this merciless Skulldozer. 
This prompted another couple of quick failures, until I finally pulled myself together and built a heist worth talking about, controlling the streets well with my crit desert fox, before dismantling a couple of bulldozers with my SMG secondary at the landing zone, opening up the space necessary for a quick escape. That experience left me dreading Green Bridge, an even more open escort mission with cops spawning at all sides. After riding my luck early on, I rolled a decent prisoner spawn and was able to successfully escort him back to the scaffolding. But here is where things really took a turn, with the upper floors flooding with more swats than I knew how to deal with. I went down once more here, before learning I could simply warbang anyone trying to disrupt the objective, meaning I didn't need to take as many potential risks, holding off for the pickup and sprinting towards the escape. This is where it gets really messy though as I started getting pincered between two sets of school dozers, forcing me to just run, at which point I was rescued by the trail of FAKs I was frantically dropping to keep this attempt alive, somehow making it to the escape zone with just one slice of healing remaining. As with most things in life, when you have a run of good luck, you tend to find the universe moves in such a way that shortly after it all gets cancelled out, which was exactly the case on the next heist Alaskan deal. Early on on this one, I found myself actually getting carried out of cover by a shield, proving that the forces of Payday were indeed conspiring against me. Let's see if they learn some of these elite AI tactics in Payday 3. In the end, this attempt was cut short by yet another successful flank by a random SWAT, breaking my limited lightweight ballistic vest and leaving me to the mercy of the dozers. Run 2 wasn't a whole lot better, as despite landing this sweet no-scope on a taser, the crowd control was already enough to see me go down without the time to place my first aid. Run 3 was the run though, with far fewer spills and thrills, allowing me to escape the heist almost immediately due to decent timing of the assault wave. The first attempt of the classic diamond heist once again showcased the Grom's problem with breaking random windows halfway across the map when fired in stealth, resulting in a quick reset. Run 2 was a more promising one, securing two bags of diamonds before setting off the alarm, which I thought would be enough to secure a loud victory, but alas, the hybrid stealth build loses its undefeated record, massively hampered without as much healing, now I'm running it with Hacker. Seeing how that worked out, I decided to immediately reset the next run after one party goer noticed a body out the corner of his eye, leading to an incident I don't think Sniper's dad would have been best pleased about. Even with an unclear conscience, attempt 4 was much better, murdering Ralph Garnett, officially breaking the Payday 2 cannon, and actually managing to maintain stealth throughout the heist for once, graced by the best escape RNG, meaning it wasn't long before I'd made it out with all 8 bags of jewellery. Reservoir Dogs next, and this was a disappointing end to attempt 1, clipped by a sniper who I really should have been more aware of. The first day of course isn't that difficult though, so I bounce back on run 2 with a nice clean getaway. The second day is where things get nasty, with the initial ambush frontloading the difficulty to the extreme. Whilst I survived this on attempt 1, only to later go down to another missed no scope, on the following 5 attempts, my life was cut short by the overwhelming fixed bulldozer spawns or the equally overpowered police responders. It was only once I changed up my strategy and straight up ran out of the store I found some success with it, using my damage bonus over range with high value target to clear a path back in towards the vault. To be honest, if you have the ability to take out snipers and keep your wits about you, those first couple of minutes are the primary challenge of this heist, as from there you simply need to gain access to the vault and move the loot, which I did in one fell swoop, crossing over the road and securing a path to escape, which was comparatively very easy. The more I challenge myself with these runs, the more I come to understand the flow of heists in Payday 2, so I really would recommend those of you looking to improve at the game, try challenges out like these, as they will force you to consider the game's mechanics differently and observe them with greater depth. Anyway, that moves us on to Brooklyn Bank, the final easy heist in my opinion, so my best opportunity to switch over to the Rattlesnake and pick up a couple of final collaterals for the last sniper achievement, Double Kill. With how the cops have to pile up on this heist, it wasn't long before the side quest of this challenge run was complete, leaving me just to blast my way into the vault and steal the amulet before fleeing straight into the sewers, apparently the Payday Gang's preferred method of transportation. Breaking feds can suck, or sometimes, you know, it just kind of falls your way. Once I'd given the camera operator the old chop chop with my bushwhacker, which doesn't sound like an okay thing for me to say on YouTube, I was all but home free on this one, almost instantly getting access to Garrett's office, where I used the tried and true 1234 code to gain immediate access to the elephant's coffer. I did slip up on the escape, but managed to avoid alerting Garrett specifically, meaning I could just ECM my way to victory for a first time sub 5 minute completion. I'm starting to feel like the sniper has made a much better stealth character than the spy. The end now in sight, Henry's Rock is another roll of the dice as far as my abilities are concerned, although once again it's an excellent heist in terms of funneling murkies into nice, grazable groups, ideal for sniping. Admittedly, the computer lab caused me some serious problems, but with Fame Death putting in a bit of an MVP performance, reviving me twice in 30 seconds, it looks as if any challenge thrown at me might be surmountable. 
The archives present a far easier objective for me next, so in no time at all, I was already marching on the exit to the bunker. I've learned not to sit out in the open whilst hacking the turrets after recent failures, but with this build, I'm so good at keeping the mercs at bay, I could take bigger risks to speed up the process. After signalling Bile, I immediately sprinted back inside the compound, as it's easier to push out again than just to hold a coverless position. This proved to be the correct gamble, as I wasted every unit between me and the escape chopper, securing all loot and fleeing, with yet another difficult first time clear to my name. Moving on to Shacklethorn Auction, my current strategy is just to stealth open the 20 second lockpick doors and reach the auctioneer objective, at which point I just shoot him where he stands to gain instant access to the office from where I can happily go loud. After getting my hands on the obsidian plate, I could just enjoy a little more corridor shooting before heading directly over to Bile for a nice, easy escape. Hell's Island can present some difficulty at the front and back end of the heist, but for builds that pick up kills easily, it's not as much of a risk. I cruise my way through the interior prison section before playing as aggressively as possible at the bridge to escape, moving lock-on almost immediately. From there, it was just one last holdout before escaping, with 30 seconds still on the clock. Not bad going for a heist, on which I timed out even with the almighty heavy. No Mercy is far too easy a heist to come this late into the run, and a build like this one is in its absolute element, shooting in straight lines down long corridors, watching the ricochets drop everything in the vicinity. Almost 20 minutes of this brutality, you couldn't see the floor for the bodies, which is exactly how you know you're having a good run. But all good runs must come to an end, and with only the White House between me and retirement in the Australian bush, I was ready. Initially, I wanted to go for some sort of hybrid stealth build with the Desert Fox on this one, but that went terribly, resulting in a brief first tour of the White House. On attempt 2, I managed to get a bit further without breaking my cover, but still find myself heading into the West Wing with a horde of Secret Service after me. On the plus side, this build was made for holdouts like these, punishing everything that spawned down the corridor with a single lethal shot until this dozer had enough of it and decided to defy the geometry of the game. I survived that fight long enough to secure the key to the Peoc, but that's where the real challenge begins, fighting tooth and nail to stay afloat and hack the mainframe, but without the firepower to really deal with the onslaught of spawning dozers. Feign death kept me going longer than I necessarily deserved, but in the end, even that wasn't enough to complete a single stage of the hack. With how brutal that failure was, I decided to pivot to the quiet MVP of this challenge run, the Grom Hybrid Stealth build, which was perfectly suited for a challenge like this. After all, nothing about those loud attempts was polite or efficient. Unfortunately, on run 3 I was forced to use two of my pages in the presidential wing, meaning I couldn't control the security of the Peoc. I tried taking one out, but that just led to an unsalvageable chain reaction, just minutes from completing the entire run. But after that setup, and a couple of attempted heists that went nowhere, I put in an attempt to be proud of, except for the part where I tried to hide a body bag with the camera guard, which inadvertently forced me to waste my second pager and make the Peoc a nightmare again or that time I ran headlong into the guy on the way to the library. But if you ignore all that, this was some very coherent stealth gameplay, assassinating this guy just for style points, before slipping my way through three guards to answer the phone and finally secure all 24 of the pardons, escaping to Lot's Chopper and completing the heist to end all heists. I know, I know, it's a little anticlimactic compared to previous runs, but something about the silent approach just felt right to me here. After all, I'd already done a fair bit to earn that crazed gunman title, so it was nice to channel the assassin style for once. With that said, I can indeed confirm that you can beat Payday 2 as the sniper from TF2, even without dipping into the life learn system, and that in my opinion, sniping is indeed a good job. It's challenging work and probably better indoors than out of doors in Payday 2, but hey, as long as there are two banks left on the planet, someone is going to want someone's bread. Which sounds like it's pretty much the plot of Payday 3, so hell yeah, this video was topical too. Thank you so much for watching. As ever, these challenge runs are a joy to put together. Take care, I'll see you all very soon in the next one. A huge thank you to my dedicated Patreon backers. If you want to join this crew in Going Infamous, check out the link below and pledge as little as $2 to see your name in the credits, or get 24 hour early access to future videos and vote on upcoming content. Take care, I'll see you all soon.